<laughs> if you like the video make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. For more videos like this, what is the scariest, unexplained slash supernatural thing that you have ever encountered? I've had a very strange experience with my dog. We were in a cemetery, and I was looking at a headstone when she alerted that someone was approaching. When I say alerted, I mean she backed up a bit and looked upwards. She didn't bark or cower, she was looking at someone who was walking up behind us. It's a large cemetery with frequent visitors, security, and groundskeepers, so I was not surprised that someone was there. I inhaled and was about to speak as I turned around to greet them. There was no one there. We were alone. I know my dog and how she reacts to people. She saw someone. I do historical and genealogical research and visit cemeteries often with her. It was the only time we've ever experienced anything odd. When it happened, I was more baffled than afraid. It was such an odd experience. When my family stayed in the UK for a month or so. We were in a nice cottage in Leeds, placed back in the hedgerows, far down a winding road. So one night my brother and I are utterly lost, coming back from a pub, trying to navigate our little Fiat Stilo home to the cottage. We are getting increasingly worried as the back roads of England can be very confusing late at night. Of course, it is pitch black, other than the moonlight, as well. Suddenly, I see someone on the road with a black dog and a walking stick. He is dressed in farmer clothes with a straw hat. We pull up to him and roll the window down. He looks at my brother and me, and before I can say anything, he says, cottage is that way, just a bit past the tree there. Don't worry, you're nearly there. Easy to get lost out here, I know. So I look to where he was pointing and turn back. He is gone. I asked my brother where he went. My brother says, who? I tell him about the guy, and he says he thought I'd just stop to try and get my bearings and pull out a map. I ask if he is sure he didn't see anyone. He says no one was ever on the road or near the car. I drove down to the tree, and a half block later, we got to the entryway for the cottage. It still gives me goosebumps. I went to college in a small but very historic town in Maine. I had rented a small boathouse for the school year with my now ex-girlfriend. It was nothing special, basically a small garage on the first level with an enclosed, squeaky staircase that led up to the apartment. At the top of the stairs, there was a hallway that went to the right, and the living room entry was pretty much straight ahead, just a bit to the right at the top of the stairs. So one night we're in the living room watching TV, and we start hearing some noises from down below in the garage area. Raccoons are common in the area and tend to get into trash cans. I stomped on the floor, and it stopped. Thinking I scared them off, it starts up again about 30 seconds later. So I tell my girlfriend I'll go scare them off. I head over to the staircase to head down the stairs. I make it about two steps down the loud stairs, and I hear the doorknob at the bottom of the staircase jiggle, as if someone were going to open it. I stopped and watched as the door popped open and then heard the sound of something running up the stairs in front of me. But I was looking down the stairs, and there was nothing coming up. I backed up quickly and stepped back into the living room, and whatever it was came up over the stairs and into the living room. We literally felt it come into the room, the whole feeling in the room changed instantly. We could still hear the footsteps as they moved in the direction of our TV, and then the TV went to white snow, and the cable box popped and turned off. Right then, the feeling went back to normal. I'm still standing in the middle of the room and looking over at my ex, frozen in fear on the couch. She yells out did you duck and feel that? It was one of the craziest things I have ever experienced. I was around 20, and my girlfriend and I were staying the night at a friend's house because it got late and they said we could crash on the couch. We fell asleep, and while we were sleeping, I could hear people walking around in the living room. Where we were sleeping so it woke me up. It was pitch black, but I could see it from the window light coming in from the porch. No one else was up. I tried to go back to sleep, but then the light switch started flicking up and down, and the porch light kept going off and on. I said heck no and tried waking my girlfriend's wife up also so we could get out of there, but she's a deep sleeper. No luck, so I got up, shaking her and calling her name. Still nothing. I told myself, well, I'll start folding the blankets, and maybe she'll get up and hear me. While I was folding the blanket, I heard my name in a girl's voice in my right ear, clear as day, and thought it was my friend. I put the blanket down, looked around, and called for my friend, but nothing happened. I was ready to leave but my girlfriend wouldn't wake up. I finally got her up and told her we needed to leave. It was about 3 a.m. we get our shoes on and head out to my truck, all while the porch light is flickering off and on even while driving away. I never stayed the night there again. I was a boy sleeping out in front of my dad's shop in a rural Thai village on a hot summer night. I woke to hear a strange, 
wispy noise, much like locusts swarming in my ears. I stared out into a lightless village market skyfront, circa early 1970s, and saw a star growing brighter and moving closer to me. Mesmerized, I watched it come closer, resembling a common object of my daily life. It looked like a large, woven bamboo skin saucer that we used to use to thrash rice husks and other strainer tasks. It zigzagged and came closer to my sleeping bench. Soon, I can make a human form on top of the rotating disc. I sat up, bewildered, and saw that it was an old woman dressed in traditional country garb. The disc with her sitting on top stopped rotating and landed right in front of my sleeping spot. She squatted up and asked me if I wanted to go with her. I had questions but could not speak. She approached me, but I could not see her feet. I said I didn't want to go with her. She grabbed my wrist. I bolted and ran into the nearest alleyway. She still held me as I ran screaming. I passed out, and the villagers found me convulsing in the alley. They said they heard some loud noises and saw a bolt of light shoot out from the alley I was in. I grew up in a haunted house. I lived there from when I was three until I was 17. This house was brand new, my parents had it built, and we have no idea how or why it was haunted. The only thing I do know is that in the town it was in, the first settlers to the area all died of some illness, and they eventually had to send more settlers to the town. Anyway, the scariest thing that ever happened to me was one time I was in the basement, it wasn't a finished basement, but we did have some beds and things down there, and I was sitting on a spare bed in the basement hanging out with a female friend of mine. All of a sudden, I looked up for some reason at the wall, and she looked as well, and I saw this thing crawling up the wall. It was all black, it had a body like a spider and eight legs, but it had the human head of a young woman with long black hair. The thing stared at us, twisted its head all the way around, smiled at us, then crawled up the concrete wall and disappeared near a window. We looked at each other, and at the same time, we said, did you see that? And we ran up the steps. I didn't go back down into the basement after that. A year later, my parents divorced, and I went with my mom who moved in somewhere else. I was watching some random TV program, and they had this old medieval painting of hell, and I shit you, not literally, that something I saw was in this painting of hell with a bunch of other demons. I freaked the hell out. I literally turned the TV off. My dad still owns this house and rents it out to people. When I was around seven, I started getting nightmares. I would wake up in the middle of the night crying for weeks on end, and then it would stop for a while before starting again. By the age of about 10, this developed into a feeling of being watched, being unable to sleep, and being convinced something was watching me from a specific corner of my room. My new room. The one my dad built my dad eventually ripped that section of wall out to show me that there was a space there. I don't remember why, but there was a space all the way around the upstairs. He tried to turn it into a fun den area for me. But I hated it, and I wouldn't go in there. This continued when, when I was about 12, I got my first smartphone. The iPhone was my dad's old one, but it worked fine. That was until it got dark outside and the phone would start typing random letters when I was texting someone or typing. This only ever happened in my bedroom. As soon as I went out of the room, it stopped. I told my dad, he said it must be damaged, and he bought me a new one for my 13th. He believes in ghosts but couldn't explain what was happening in the room he built. The new phone did the same thing. I thought I was going mad. I bought some spell candles from a witchcraft museum when we went on holiday. I was around 14. I used them to politely ask whoever or whatever was there to please leave the house peacefully. This worked, and I was perfectly okay in that room again. I slept fine, and my phones were all fine as I upgraded and got new ones. I moved out when I was 20. I went to visit my parents and stayed the night in my old room. Whatever was there when I was a child is back there. The same corner, the same feeling. The same dark energy, the same creature except now I have an image of it burned into my memory despite never actually seeing it. It's a dark creature. It has some type of human shape but is very muscular, and it crawls around on all fours, legs bent behind it, almost wolfish but without a snout. It snarls and glares. Dark red eyes with big black pupils. It has horns as well. Its big horns curled back over its head. There's some type of red tinge to it, but I can't identify where it comes from. I was attending a small college in Pennsylvania at the time, and my roommate and I were up late on a weeknight smoking weed and trying to find something to do. We decided to go to a tunnel in the middle of the woods that is supposed to be haunted. Like way out in the woods, with basically no road. If your car hangs low, you are not getting there. Stories say they see a woman who had hung herself from the entrance of the tunnel many years ago still hanging or someone walking up behind your parked car. You drive through the tunnel, turn your car and lights off, want to do it around midnight or later, 
etc. We have been there before, followed all the rules, and nothing ever happened. But this time was much different. We drive there, drive through the tunnel, turn off the car, turn off the lights, sit, and allow your eyes to adjust to the darkness. It's like that advanced darkness Spongebob quote. All you can see is the dim light from the moon and the dark silhouettes of the trees. So my roommate and I sit there, just talking but also paying attention to the end of the tunnel. A few minutes go by, and we are starting to get ready to leave. Out of the corner of the tunnel, it looks like a small object has appeared on one side of the bank. I think nothing of it and blink hard to readjust my eyes, thinking maybe I am just seeing things. When I am readjusted, it is still there, but this time whatever it is starts to move. Whatever this thing was reminded me of Gollum, except it had longer, skinnier arms, which almost had a jagged appearance at the joints. Whatever this thing was stopped dead in the center of the tunnel, twisted its head, and looked right at us, then hurriedly crawled to the other side. Before I could even get out the word go. My roommate had the car on and was driving as fast as we could out of there without ripping up the bottom of his car. No one really says anything until we get to the main road. At this point, I'm thinking my mind is playing tricks on me. Maybe my roommate didn't see anything and just heard me say go and left. We get to the main road, and he turns to me and says, did you ever see Lord of the Rings? This clarified for me that we both saw the same thing, so there is no way our minds played the same exact trick on us. There was definitely something there. To this day, that is still the only explanation I have for that night. I have no idea what that was or what I saw. My husband is a pest control technician, and he normally has to drive pretty far out in the woods to do his job. One day his GPS took him to an abandoned Freemasons building, which the GPS said was the firehouse he was supposed to be servicing. While he was slightly confused, he figured it was the right address and started spraying for bugs. When he gets to the back of a building, he sees a basement door open. Like one of those doors that are technically in the ground but lead to a basement under the house. He told me he could hear what sounded like someone walking, but he just hollered down into the basement and said that he was just the pest technician doing a job. He then hears what he explained to me in a monotone voice and says, Hey, I need some help, he said it didn't sound like the voice was struggling or anything. He just replied, saying, is everything okay? Are you hurt? The voice just repeated, I need help. He couldn't see anyone down in the basement, and there weren't any apparent lights to see anyone either. My husband is a 6 foot 2, 250 pound man, normally, people don't mess with him or would even try to talk to him, and people don't scare him easily. But he noped the hell out there. He said the entire time he walked back to his truck around the front of the building, it felt like something was right behind him watching him leave. He was confused as to why the GPS brought him there, but he eventually found the right place he was supposed to be. He called me after he had service to tell me all this. I was a passenger in a tractor trailer driving between Coerdaline, Idaho, and Spokane, Washington. It was about 11 p.m. We were in a wooded area. A woman was standing in the center of the road ahead of us, and she was obviously a spectator. She was transparent. She did not look right. We drove through her, and she yelled, help me, and I tried to grab my shoe through the door of the truck. So, the death state was confirmed. We both saw her. I told her to get off and get out. I used whatever will I had to break her grip on the step and push the top half of her back out of the cab. Somehow, it worked. She was trying to reach my foot by holding on to the inside step with one hand and reaching for me with the other. Yeah. We were both shaken. We both saw her. I said, I'm sorry, towards the road behind us, about five miles later after we had the talk. Did you see her, too? Yes, damn it. I was driving for Uber at the time, and it was really late at night or early in the morning. I had dropped a man off at a really nice place in the Hollywood Hills. I wasn't too familiar with this particular upscale residential area, so I put my GPS on to work my way out of it. It was really dark out, and the neighborhood was extremely quiet and upscale. I felt like I didn't need to be there. Anyhow, GPS leads me to this hill with a chain-link fence. One side of the fence said, do not enter. No trespassing. But the other side of the fence was wide open, and GPS was directing me to go through it. As I go through the gate, I'm going more and more uphill, and I look to my right, and there is nothing but a dark, empty hillside or space on either side of me. Suddenly, I see this thin white lady with short, blonde hair and a blue nightgown in my rear view mirror. It was a beautiful nightgown with, like, a see-through robe or whatever that matched the nightgown. I immediately braked and was able to see her face in the glow of my bright brake lights. I thought she looked really sad, and I wanted to help her. Also, it was cold out, so my first instinct was to help her, but just as soon as I saw her, 
she disappeared without a trace and literally had nowhere to hide or run. I was freaked out and on edge, so I kept driving up this hill, and then my passenger seat belt notification sound went off. I know that no one is in the car with me, so it really freaked me out even more than I already was, so I just made a U-turn and found another way out. It was so freaky. I told my kids about it, and they begged me to take them back there, but I never bothered going back. My mom grew up outside Boston in suburban MA in the 60s and 70s, and there were plenty of areas closer to town that weren't as developed as today. She was a teenager, 13 to 14 years old, and like most teenagers of the time, one of the big things to do was walk down power lines and have parties or just hang out in the woods. So one evening, it was just her, a female friend, and her friend's dog. He's a small terrier type of dog, kind of barky and energetic most of the time. They're hanging out by some power lines for a few hours, eventually, a few more people show up, and my mom and her friend want to head off somewhere else to talk by themselves and smoke a joint. So they find a trail and head off a few hundred yards into the woods. It was late summer, and from what she set up in Massachusetts, it would still be light out until like 9 or 10 p.m. They talked for a while, and by this point, it was a little after 11 p.m. time to head back before their parents got really worried, you know? As they're heading back, her friend's dog gets quiet and stops sniffing around and exploring like he usually does. And as they're walking, he starts hanging really close to them, only straying a couple feet away at most. They're feeling uneasy and end up looking around to see if there's some sort of coyote or something nearby stalking them. But the trail was dark, and they only had a cheap flashlight. They get back to the power lines, and everyone is already gone. There was no reason to hang around, so they started down the trail through more woods, back to their neighborhood. There was more light here, as she said there was moonlight, and it was an open field kind of area. A little ways down the trail, her friend's dog stops and won't move, it just sits there whimpering. That's when my mom said she first saw it. They look back, and by the brightness of the open field, they see something huge blocking the trail between them and the field. I couldn't really see features as the side facing them was in shadow, but at this point, they don't care what it is. By the dog's reaction, it's time to GTFO. Her friend picked up her dog, and they ran as fast as they could down the trail back to their neighborhood. My mom said she could hear it running down the trail after them. It was only a couple hundred feet, and the trail came out at the end of a cul-de-sac on an undeveloped street in the neighborhood. They didn't stop until they were a bit down the street, at which point my mom looked back and saw it standing in the cul-de-sac lit up by a streetlight. She swore it was much larger than any man she had seen, probably 7-8 plus tall. Up until now, she and her friend thought it had been a creepy dude following them. Seeing this, she said her stomach dropped and her hair stood up on the back of her neck, an incredible feeling of dread. They took off running and didn't stop until they got to her friend's house a few streets over, but they said they didn't hear it following, she said they didn't go back there for months afterwards. And when they did, it was only for large parties. And yet she couldn't shake the feeling that something was out there in the woods on the far side of the power lines. When I was eight, my family moved to Kansas City. The house we rented was in an old residential neighborhood and was a hulking, yellow Victorian monster. It was built somewhere around 1920, according to public records, and, at one point, was a doctor's office. When we first moved in, I immediately clocked the basement as creepy AF. It was unfinished, the stone walls were flaky, and the single bulb flickered and cracked. It scared the TF out of me. The fuse box, yep, that old, was located in the basement as well. One night, after about two weeks of being there, a fuse blew. Only my mom and I were home at the time, and she was on a ladder upstairs painting a ceiling. She yelled downstairs for me to get the flashlight. It must be in the basement from when I was fixing the dryer. Run down and get it. Immediate fear makes you sweat. It's dark, mom. I can't see. I whine pathetically. It's on the workbench. Light a candle and go get it. I can't believe you're still afraid of a little darkness. It took all of my little eight-year-old courage. With shaking hands, I lit a candle and slowly made my way to the basement stairs. I stood at the top, quivering like a leaf in a thunderstorm, trying to convince myself to be brave. I took the first step. Then the second, and third, fourth, fifth. On the sixth step, I lost my footing and fell the last five, extinguishing my candle. Now, I'm in the basement alone, in near total darkness. I start to cry. The only light at all is coming from a tiny egress window about a foot above my head. There is, because of this tiny window, about a one foot square of sickly yellow light coming from the streetlight outside. I jumped into that square of light because it felt like my only source of safety. My thought was, get to the light, 
and you'll be able to see the flashlight. The flashlight? What are you doing? Mom's voice came through the vents. I fell. I'm coming, I yelled back. I could see now that the flashlight was about two feet away on the workbench, where mom said it would be. I leap and close the gap between me and the workbench. I grab the flashlight, flick it on, and sweep the beam across the basement. At first, I felt silly. I'm eight years old. I shouldn't still be afraid of the dark. I giggle at myself and sweep the flashlight across the basement again. Then I froze. In the beam of my flashlight, in the kneel and pray room on the other side of the basement, there is a girl. She had long, blonde, curly hair. She wore a blue, lacy dress that came to her knees, and in her hands, she held a single yellow flower. Most notably, she appeared to be soaking wet. I began to tremble. I can't even scream, my voice is caught in my throat. You know the shutter walk thing you see ghosts do in movies, where one second they're across the room and the next second they're right next to you. That happens. In the blink of an eye, if I could have blinked, she was right next to me. Hey, she whispered, that unlocked my legs and my voice. I tore out of the basement screaming bloody murder and didn't stop till I was at mom's ladder. What is the matter with you? She asked me, coming down. There's a girl in the basement, I yelled. She tutted, you were the only girl in the basement. I honestly can't believe you're still buying into the boogeyman. It's not the boogeyman. It's a girl, and she's down there. She said, hey to me, I insisted. She was not a person, mama. She was a ghost, I said it matter-of-factly, miffed that she didn't believe me. A ghost? She laughed again. Come on, let's go see your ghost. She grabbed the flashlight in my arm and started pulling me downstairs. Don't make me go back, mama. I don't want to see her again, I cried. Don't be ridiculous, I'm going to show you that it's all in your head. You probably saw a dress on a hanger or something, let's go. She led me back to the basement door, where I tried to balk again, but she insisted. We'll go down and fix the fuse, and you'll see that it's your imagination. We go down and into the fuse box room uneventfully, though I am still horrified. She fixed the fuse, and all the lights came on. I started to feel silly again. There, now. See. Nothing to worry about. I notice she's looking over my shoulder at the floor. I go to turn around, but before I can, mom grabs me. What did the girl look like? She asked. I describe her. When I say the part about being wet, mom goes pale and lets me go. I turn around and look, only to realize little wet footprints are leading from the kneel and pray room to where I had been standing in the light. It was the most haunted place I've ever been. I work overnight, and my husband stays home with my daughter. I left around 10 p.m., and around 12.30, my daughter messaged me and asked me if I was home. I told her no. She said when she let the dogs out to go to the bathroom, she swears she heard me calling her name from a distance in the backyard. It really freaked her out, to the point where she was crying. She's usually very level-headed and never cries, so it freaked me out too. I told her to wake my husband up and have him look around and lock all the doors. She's not one to lie about things, I don't know the explanation, but she genuinely thought it was me. There are no women that live in our neighborhood that would know her name either. Our house was built in 1900, so we have had spooky things happen to us there many times. I'm not saying I think it was necessarily supernatural, it was just very strange. When I was a teenager, we moved into a house on the edge of town, where my family and I experienced what I can only call severe demonic oppression. While playing in the woods with friends one evening, we encountered what I would describe as a shadow person, but with incredible definition, we could see his thinning, long hair. This thing screamed at us and chased us all the way back to our house. Soon after, the doors in our house began opening and closing in the night, as did the cupboards. Cups and knives were apparently thrown around the kitchen by no one. We discovered that the man who built the house was involved in the occult, and my grandmother came over and confirmed that something terrible had happened there. It reached a peak with my brother seeing and announcing that the red woman was coming. That night, I and my other siblings saw the woman, as accurately corroborated by my brother, who saw her first. After convincing our parish priest to exorcise the house, which he did, to great effect but not totally eradicating the issue, we moved to another home. I had an experience with a Wendigo this fall in early October in northern Minnesota in a state forest, very close to, if not on, a reservation. I've always heard that speaking of them can draw them to you. But I hadn't thought of or listened to any Wendigo stories any time close to my encounter. I was staying with some very dear friends, I'll call them M and C and they have a camper in their yard by the lake for guests to sleep in. I had walked down to the camper from the house with my miniature dachshund, 
ebony, around midnight and found that I needed to set some things up, primarily the heater. By the time I was done getting everything in order, it was approximately 1.30. I never thought to lock the door because, really, I figured it's in the middle of the woods, so there was nothing to worry about. I was wrong. I had closed the curtains, and I was having trouble falling asleep because my anxiety was going mad, M and C's dogs were barking outside, and their geese wouldn't stop honking. Ebony, who usually sleeps under the covers, was sitting on my hip while I lay on my side, and I could feel her turning her head back and forth, like she was trying to track something outside. I tried tucking her under the blankets to calm her down, but she kept returning to her perch on my hip. I have no idea how long I laid there. I would say at least 40 minutes, when all of a sudden I heard M's voice outside the camper, anybody in there? Hmm. And what sounded like claws dragged down the side of the camper. I almost called back to her when I realized one, she and C were both fast asleep by now, and two, M knew I was in there. She wouldn't ask if anybody was. Suddenly, I noticed everything had gone absolutely silent outside. The dogs and the birds had stopped carrying on, the gusts of wind had even stopped. It was the kind of silence you hear about in horror stories, how the woods go mute when something evil is in the area. Then another thought hit me, Ebony would be losing her SHT and barking at the door if that had been anything human. She was frozen on my hip, dead quiet, shaking. I didn't dare to move, but I was really starting to have to pee. And I remembered that I hadn't locked the door. I have no idea how long I laid there debating whether I should get up and use the bathroom and lock the door, but it felt like an eternity. In reality, I guessed it was maybe 10 to 15 minutes. I thought it may have been a skinwalker at first, but I remembered they don't mimic the voices of your loved ones to lure you into the woods. Wendigo Ag do. I knew these creatures, demons, whatever they are, can lure humans out of their abodes if they make eye contact with you, and everything in me was screaming to make sure I didn't look outside. I made doubly sure I didn't look through any cracks in the curtains as I walked softly to the front of the camper and very slowly turned the lock, praying and holding my breath. I made sure to keep my eyes away from the windows as I crawled back in bed and pulled Ebony close, and she finally stayed under the blankets. I snuck a peek at my phone for the time before I laid down, figuring it had to be close to 3 a.m., the witching hour, it was about 2.30. As soon as I laid down, the wind kicked back up, and M and C's basset hounds erupted into howls as they came running down to the camper and a little ways into the trees, and the geese started their noise again. I heard the bassets come back to the camper, barking a few more times before they laid down outside the door to protect me. I didn't get out of bed again that night. I told M and C what had happened the next morning. I think I was hoping M would say she had come down to check on me and Ebony, but she confirmed what I already knew, they had gone to bed as soon as I had left the house. I said a prayer over their house, the camper, and all of us the following night and had an uneventful night. Thank God. I also spoke with another guy who's familiar with the supernatural to see if he knew any more about Wendigo's. He advised me never to go outside to pee at night if I ever go camping, to bring a bucket or something to use, and to make sure that I always close tent flaps and curtains before falling asleep. He said if the flaps are open so you can see outside, the Wendigo can make eye contact with you and draw you out. After leaving M and C's to go to my father's house for a few days, I had the distinct feeling of being watched when I took Ebony outside after dark. My father lives three hours away from M and C, but his house is in the country. I told myself it was only the fear from the experience and what I knew about the Wendigo triggering an overactive imagination. I never heard anything, and I watched Ebony's behavior very closely, and she didn't act like she had in the camper. I'm moving back to that area from Canada, and this experience has been weighing heavily on my mind. I've been trying to find any information about warding them off. When I was a teenager, I was driving in my car with my friend and her dog. We stopped at a gas station, and my friend got out. She went inside to get something, and it was me and her little dog who were sitting next to me in the passenger seat. I was just relaxing when I looked up into my rearview mirror. All of a sudden, I thought to myself, who's that man in the back? He had white, luminescent skin, dark eyes, and what looked like a kind of flat-top haircut. My heart sank into my stomach. He was looking around with the biggest smile on his face, but then he locked eyes on mine through the mirror. His happiness went to horror, like, O-S-H-T, oh, she can see me. I looked away, heard a swoosh, and bolted out of my car. I ducking ran as my friend walked out of the gas station. I started screaming, there's a man in my car. She immediately started banging on my car, saying get the duck out, very brave, and when we opened up the car, he was gone. I was so traumatized. Driving in my car alone was so hard for so long. I waited years for any type of answer or reassurance that I wasn't crazy. One day I put on an alien documentary called Walking with the Tall Whites, 
and I said, oh my God, is that what I saw, an alien? My view of the world has forever been altered. I was in my early 20s and working as a student at a funeral home in Arlington, Texas. It was just me and two other students that evening, closing after a large visitation. There was a chapel attached to the back of the building that wound around to the front so that the entrance to said chapel and the funeral home were separated by a garden-type sitting area or vestibule. In order to lock up for the night, we would lock the front chapel door from the outside, by the garden, so we would not have to walk through the huge, dark chapel to get back into the main portion of the funeral home. So, it's about 9 p.m., and in the winter, it's nice and dark out. I'm in a giddy mood, as I distinctively remember singing and jaunting merrily up to the door of the darkened chapel. We always left a lamp on in the chapel entry room, and the glow was visible through the stained glass window on the door. I grabbed the handle to turn it to assure that it was already locked for the night, and immediately from the inside, a figure seemed to move quickly towards the door, blocking the lamplight from the view of the window. Almost at the same instant my hand was about to release the door handle, it violently twisted in the opposite direction of what I had been turning it. The door frame shook as the door butted up against it from the inside. The door was locked, but it did have some play in the handle even when locked, I shot across the garden, flowers be damned, and entered the reception area of the funeral home, where both my co-workers were sitting. We were all accounted for, no one else was in the chapel. A few other things that happened at that funeral home, which, by the way, was surrounded by a cemetery, we would occasionally hear furniture move or scrape across the attic floor, several times, extra tables and chairs stored up there would be moved around, but no more than a few feet each time. The freezer door would open on its own, eventually, they had to buy a lock for it. My cousin and I were playing outside one day. We made up this game that was part hide and seek and part freeze tag. We could hide anywhere outside, in the garage, or in the bar area my grandpa had built. The game would end if one of us snuck back into the front yard and touched a tree that was base. My cousin was good at hiding, the best. I couldn't find him anywhere, and I was about to call it quits. I figured he was already waiting at the tree, so I decided to walk there, and to my surprise, he's there. He's staring at the tree, standing completely still, and swinging a stick side to side. I call his name. He doesn't move. I yell at him. He doesn't respond. I start to get frustrated and yell at him again. Fine, he can be like that. I turn around to make my way into the house, and I bump right into my cousin and make him drop two ice cream cones my grandma had made for us. After I started counting, he went inside. He was inside the entire time. I look back at the tree, and the stick is placed upright on the ground. Whatever or whoever I saw was not my cousin. I used to work at an old Soviet camp in rural Ukraine. It used to be a summer camp for children, and now its current owners are renovating it. Anyway, I worked on installing heating in a smaller building 400-ish meters away from the main facility. And to get there, you have to pass near a small, silicate brick building. I don't know its purpose, but it's relevant. So, one day in the middle of August, I was coming back from lunch break and was going towards that little building. It was painted white and had tiny square windows on each side of the door. It was square, each wall was around 10 feet long and 7 feet high. As I came closer, I noticed something moving behind it. I was around 25 meters away from it, but I didn't pay much attention to it. I first thought it was merely a reflection of light because I have astigmatism. But I also had that same feeling when I encountered anything supernatural. I had paranormal encounters before. As I came closer, what I saw made my skin crawl. It was a pallid blue girl's face staring at me with a toothy grin. It wasn't an illusion or a hallucination, and when I picked up the pace, its gaze followed me and the head turned. It looked almost normal except for the stretched skin and uneven expression. I saw it very clearly. That girl looked like she had asphyxiated. After that, I heard screams varying in pitch when I passed that shed. I also saw red eyes staring at me from unlit rooms and the perpetual feeling of being watched. It was wild. My intuition tells me that she's not the only ghost or entity here. So, until I was 10, me and my family lived in a ghetto-type neighborhood, and I don't know why, but something always felt off in the apartment we were in. When I was around 6 or 7 years old, I would see tall, pure black humanoid creatures with big white eyes just in the corner of my eyes running around the corner. After some more encounters, I tried running behind, but I never saw anything. Around that time, I also started having nightmares about either me getting chased by supernatural creatures like zombies, which were probably just me starting to watch child horror movies, or either me waking up late at night and hearing footsteps or the front door opening or closing. In the second scenario, I always stood up quietly, 
going through the apartment to look for the source of the noises, and every time I would find either the tall creature or a man with a briefcase in the living room. That briefcase contained things like knives or small blades. Either way, the creature or man would then proceed to go through the apartment and kill all of my family, at least that's what I think, because it would come back blood-coated. It would chase me to the outside of the apartment complex, and while running, everything would just turn black, and I would wake up in sweat. That happened a few more times over the years, and the nightmares would suddenly just stop at some point. The thing with me seeing that tall, black creature ended when we moved. One night about a year ago, I was trying to fall asleep but just couldn't get to sleep. At one point, I was asleep but awake, so I decided to open my eyes, and I saw what looked like a good-sized winged creature fly at my face. It had wings, legs, arms, and a humanoid-type face. I jumped up and turned my light on. I searched every inch of my room to see if I could find it, thinking maybe it was just a huge moth, but a moth is impossible to get that big. I stayed up really early in the morning. I haven't seen it since, and I believe it could have been a fairy-type creature. I know for sure that it wasn't a dream. I've believed in the supernatural since I was seven, besides ghosts, this is the only monster encounter I have had. There's a place called Dead End Alley near where I live. It has a dark history. When we reached 10 years old, my cousin and I were allowed to play on the street just outside my aunt's house. There was a busy lane that ran down beside the side of the houses, and my cousin, our friends, and I spent hours of fun running and wheeling up and down that lane. There was a little dead end alley just leading off the lane, which always had a weird vibe around it, there was only one house at the end of the dead end alley, as all the kids used to call it. The house was different from all the other houses around it, it was always dark, and even on a sweltering hot summer day, it always seemed to have a gloom hanging over it like a dark, ominous cloud. Obviously, we, being merely 10 years old, were banned by my mama and aunt from going anywhere near the alley, let alone the empty, abandoned house. One typical summer's day, my cousin and I were playing in the lane with our friends. We kept hearing a baby crying, now, being in the middle of a council estate, it is not uncommon to hear a baby cry, so we paid no attention. However, as the afternoon wore on, the baby's cry became louder and more constant, almost deliberate. That got our attention, and we all decided to investigate the noise, so we stopped playing and began to look around. To our horror, after searching for the route of the noise, we realized that the baby's cries were originating from the front garden of the Dead End Alley house. One of our friends, who was slightly older, said he would go closer to have a look. We were all concerned by now, as it seemed obvious to all present that it was a real baby who was in distress, but everyone present also pleaded with him not to do it, but he was, and still is, a very principled, moral person, and his conscience overcame him. We waited for 10 minutes until he came back. He looked awful, his face was white as a sheet, and he looked physically shaken. He told us that he went into the garden, but there was no sign of a baby anywhere. His best friend asked him if he saw anything else, and he just nodded and said, I don't want to talk about it. Nobody forced the issue, in fact, I think everyone was secretly relieved about it. We left very quickly and returned to the safety of home. Years later, my cousin and I were talking to her mom, and she began to tell us about the history of the local area. The subject of the Dead End Alley house came up. We were horrified by what my aunt told us, it still gives me chills talking about it now. In the 1940s, the area where their family lived was way rougher than it is today, with lots of prostitution and unwed mothers. It turns out that the house in Dead End Alley was a baby farm, where women took their babies that they couldn't look after or didn't want a woman or couples, and for a fee, they would take these abandoned infants in and find good homes for them. It was said by the locals that the couple running the baby farm was quite an unsavory pair, and there were rumors at the time of coercion and intimidation of young unwed mothers to give the awful couple their babies and neglect and abuse of their young charges. Then the scandal was uncovered. In the 1950s, the remains of several infant bodies were found in the front garden in a shed where the husband kept his gardening tools. The couple were obviously charged. We don't really know what the truth is about what happened that hot summer day long ago, but my cousin and I have our theories. My cousin still lives in the same house with her own family and my auntie, and every time my husband and I visit them, I still get the chills when passing by Dead End Alley, and our friend who went to look for the distressed baby, who my cousin and I are still friends with, never revealed what he saw in the garden of the Dead End Alley house. My farm has been in my family's name since 1798, it was built on an Indian burial ground, I know that's always what people say, but I'm 100% serious. All throughout my childhood, I've heard stories passed down from my ancestors. Stories like our livestock disappearing and names being called from the tree line, you know, 
the normal ghost stories you get told by the campfire. I always thought they were just stories, but something that happened yesterday changed my mind completely. While I was trying to sleep watching Seinfeld, like I always do, the dogs started to go crazy, which is pretty normal, but then I started to hear whimpers as soon as a scream started. It was like no scream I have ever heard. It was high pitched and low pitched at the same time. I immediately grabbed my 12 gauge and ran outside as fast as I could, but then everything just went still, no screaming, no barking, hell even the cicadas stopped chirping. It was the most terrifying silence I have ever experienced. I turned on my phone light and started scanning the perimeter of the dog pen when I noticed whispering from the tree line. It was a weird whisper, like it was beckoning me to come closer, but it was in a language I could not understand. As any sane person would do, I immediately ran inside, locked the doors, and double-checked that the windows were locked. As soon as I got inside, all the noises started again. The cicadas and the dogs were all normal. As I went upstairs, I had a terrible feeling of being watched, and I just couldn't sleep. I haven't slept since then, and I'm terrified of what may happen tonight. The teachers have decided to carry out a camping session in our school after a month of our final exams. They thought we could be more relaxed with fun-filled games and sleeping in tents that they provided. After the games, that night my friend and I wanted to head to the bathroom, so we walked slowly while chatting and laughing to the bathroom. As we were headed to the bathroom, I spotted a figure that looked like one of our subject teachers. That figure was walking into the cooperation room, Billet Koperasi, and closed the door behind her. My friend quickly turned over to the camping site, which was situated in the foyer, but we did not spot her anywhere. Didn't we just ask her permission before going to the bathroom? My friend asked me curiously. Someone couldn't walk that fast to that room from the foyer because there is a mini staircase that we have to climb down to the ground floor. I have a bad feeling now. Let's go back to our tents now, I said to her immediately. We paced back to our tent and realized that our teacher was sitting in the footsteps of the staircase as she filled up our food form for the next day. We decided to ask her if she was the one we saw entering the cooperation room. Our teacher said she was sitting there all the time, and she did not have the keys to that room. We were shocked and told our teacher what we saw that night, and she claimed that this similar incident happened to our sports teacher two days ago when they were having the school football tournament. One of the players saw someone who looked just like their football couch walking all over the school when the football coach left right after the event due to some emergency that day. This continued to happen until I graduated from school, and we never attempted to visit our school at night. This happened to me and my best friend. I'm 17 currently, and he is 18. At the time, we were both Christians, and this experience scared the living hell out of us. I was spending the night at his house, and his mom wanted us to walk their dog before it got too late. It was around 8 to 9 at night. This wasn't the first time we had walked around at night. In my friend's neighborhood, there is an elementary school. We would always go there and let his dog run around on the field. We arrived at the school, but we didn't feel like going onto the field. We decided to walk around the school instead. After passing the classrooms and gym, we walked around the perimeter of the field, which has a chain-link fence. I noticed that when we made a left, towards the last stretch of fence, there were two people waiting on the curb across the street. We assumed it was just a couple walking, but we couldn't really make them out except for dark, human-like figures. We got a little spooked and decided to pick up the pace. I turned around, and they were following us. I whispered to my friend, and he saw them about 20 feet behind us, on the corner we just turned. At this point, we weren't just spooked, we were pretty scared. We started to fast walk down the sidewalk. When we made it to the end of the chain-link fence, about 30 feet from where I turned and whispered to my friend, we noticed they had already made it all the way down the sidewalk before the corner we turned and first saw them. There is no way they could have turned and made it there in that time, even sprinting. My friend's day started to whine, and we decided to ducking book it back to my friend's place. As this was the neighborhood he grew up in, he knew a shortcut back to his house. The only other way to get to his home is to walk about two blocks on the main road. We were out of breath by the time we made it back, and we had sprinted as fast as our legs could carry us. We opened his front gate, and I turned around to see if anything was there, and lo and behold, there were two black human-like figures on the main road, walking towards his house. We ran inside, locked the door, and prayed to God that nothing would happen. We searched for ways to get rid of demons, pray, etc. Nothing else happened that night. We talked to our pastor, and he told us about an experience with a demon he had as a child. He told us to memorize certain prayers and trust in God. We have no idea what it was that was there that night, all we knew was that we had to run away as fast as possible. Seneca Indian Reservation Salamanca, New York White Dog Slash Wolf Before 2003 
I was 10 years old or younger when this took place. I was riding with my aunt, and we passed a triangle fork in the road that split the road both ways. On the right side of the road was the base of a really large hill. Right at the tip of the triangle patch of grass, there was a white wolf or dog standing there and staring up at the mountain. My aunt and I saw it and commented on it, and she pulled over on the side of the road and told me to go get it. I laughed and thought she was joking, but she raised her voice to me, and her eyes looked different to me, and she told me to go get the dog. I was reluctant but didn't want to get into trouble, so I figured it was safe if she told me to, and I got out of the car and slowly approached the dog. You would think a normal dog would turn around and stare at the car that stopped, listen to the door being opened, and either greet the person approaching him or run away, right? Well, this dog stood frozen in place, staring up at the hill. As I got closer, I saw that his fur was all white, and he looked like a short-haired husky, German shepherd, or wolf, I suppose, for lack of a better word. His coat was short and dirty, and he didn't have a collar or seem like a pet. He also didn't seem like a regular goofy or aggressive res dog that I had seen my whole life growing up. One of the weirdest things about him was that he was this wild looking animal, but he didn't have a tail. Not even a little stump, like somebody clipped it. It was just smooth all the way down his tailbone. I walked right up to this dog, and he didn't respond at all until I reached out my hand to pet him. I was about two inches from his body when he turned around, and I saw that he had one blue and one brown eye. We just looked at each other, and then he walked off. I really felt like I was seeing something I wasn't supposed to at the time, and it just felt unnatural to me, if that makes sense. I got back in the car, and my aunt didn't say anything to me the rest of the ride. To this day, she doesn't remember this event happening and won't talk about it. Seven years ago, my wife and I purchased a property in 11 acres of woods in a rural part of northeastern Minnesota. I'm not a believer in the supernatural and have never been afraid of the woods or the outdoors, even though I have a healthy sense of caution and respect for large bears, moose, wolves, or other potentially dangerous wildlife. The house and land had been abandoned for a couple of years due to foreclosure, so a lot of work needed to be done to get them back into shape. One night during those first few weeks, we had a rainstorm, and I was worried about a broken downspout potentially causing a basement leak. It was about 10 p.m., so I grabbed my headlamp and headed outside to deal with the situation. Behind our house is a fairly large swampy area that divides the woods. I had my back facing this area while fiddling with the downspout when suddenly I had this intense feeling of dread. It's really hard to explain the feeling, but it was like my body knew something was back there. It was very unusual based on the circumstances. Never having felt this type of fear before, I tried to stay calm and slowly turned around to point my headlamp back towards the swamp. What I saw was something I still can't explain. Eyes, numerous glowing or reflecting eyes, stare back at me. These were not eye reflections that you typically see with a deer or other animal since they were at different heights, and when I pointed my headlamp spot beamed directly at where you would expect a head to be, there was nothing there but weeds and trees. When I turned the headlamp off, they were still there and glowing as if a light were being shined. They did not move, they just stared through me. Needless to say, I bolted and ran as fast as I could back into the house and explained it away as deer or raccoons. Later that summer, I was sitting out on our screened-in porch that partially faces the swamp and connected woods to the west. It was approximately 11 p.m. when I began to hear what sounded like a bear fighting with or attacking a cow. It sounded so strange and almost supernatural. It didn't frighten me since I had this rational explanation in my head. Even weirder, this same series of sounds happened again the next summer. In the first few years, I never investigated the area of the woods where the sounds came from since it was not my property. A couple of years later, one hunting season, I was entering this area en route to another stand when I saw a violent thrashing in the foliage, moving fast and crossing from right to left but moving away from my position. I, of course, encounter deer and bears all the time, so I am familiar with how they move when spooked, but this was something different. Whatever this thing was, a high-pitched trumpeting combined with a bellowing sound that was like nothing I'd ever heard from an animal outside of an elk, which we don't have in this area. It wasn't bounding, and there wasn't a raised white tail or large dark mass to indicate a deer or bear. There really didn't appear to be a body at all, just whipping and falling leaves and branches along with the deafening sounds. That same year, my son had a friend over, and they went for a late afternoon walk in the woods. As it began to get dark, they made their way back by walking on the edge of the field that is next to this area of woods. As they passed by, they said they saw a figure a little ways off in the trees. Whatever they saw was near one of the hills in this patch of forest and seemed to be making some kind of hand gesture. It began walking slowly towards them when they called out hey, hello. He or it stopped still and said nothing. At this point, the boys sensed something wasn't right and bolted back towards the house. 
they rushed into the house and told me what they saw, and I of course laughed it off as their minds played tricks on them. My son described the figure as very tall, like 10 to 15 feet, but with skinny arms, and his body was dark all over. Not hairy per se, but dark. They even thought it was an animal at first because of the weird way it looked. He couldn't really describe it very well other than gaunt, skinny, and strangely dark. Me being the curious and protective father I am, I was worried about it being trespassers, drug addicts, or both, so I told them I would go take a look. They brought me to the area and pointed to where it was standing, and I headed into the woods. Since it was winter and there was snow on the ground, I thought it would be easy to locate the tracks of whatever this was and find out where it came from or went to. When I got to the spot, there wasn't a single track or disturbance in the snow. There was no way an animal or man could have been in that area and not left tracks. They had either made it up or their minds had played tricks on them. Or so I thought. To this day, my son and his friends still swear they saw it clearly, and I can definitely attest that their fright was real. All of this brings me to today, where I had a sudden realization that all of the strange sounds, sightings, bones, and events seem to be centered around this one area, and I'm just at a complete loss for what it all means.